Hello, everyone. If you are just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be a conversation with Fred Turner on democracy and media. I'd like to welcome our speakers to the virtual stage to begin our session. Um, hi, Fred. Nice to, uh, nice to see you. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us today. Hi, Matt. Pleasure to be here. So I just want to start by um, acknowledging that uh, people will be watching this on Juneteenth. Um, and we are really in uh, just an absolutely extraordinary historical moment. Um, and I think it's, it's important that we, that we consider that. And in, in my view, your work actually um, has a, sheds a lot of light on some of the ways that systemic racism and oppression have perpetuated themselves um, over the years. And um, maybe that will, will come out a bit in our, in our conversation. Um, with that said, uh, so my name is Matt Pruitt. I'm president of Radical Exchange Foundation. Uh, I'm joined today by Fred Turner. Uh, Fred Turner is the Harry and Norman Chandler Professor of Communication at Stanford University. Uh, he's the author of three books, The Democratic Surround, Multimedia and American Liberalism from World War II to the Psychedelic 60s, From Counterculture to Cyberculture, Stuart Brand, The Whole Earth Network, and The Rise of Digital Utopianism, and Echoes of Combat, The Vietnam War in American Memory. Before coming to Stanford, he taught communication at Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government and MIT's Sloan School of Management. He also worked for 10 years as a journalist, and he has written for newspapers and magazines ranging from the Boston Globe Sunday Magazine to Harper's. We are uh, truly thrilled to have you, so thank you. I'm thrilled to be here, thank you. Um, so I wanna say a little bit about what brought me to your work. Um, I, uh, I, I grew up in the Bay Area, you've got the, uh, the Golden Gate uh, behind you. Yeah. And um, uh, as I was growing up, I was kind of, you know, not, not exactly immersed, but somewhat, somewhat peripherally um, connected to the, the technology culture in, in, the, in the 90s and the 2000s. And um, I've actually spent a, a long time sort of worrying about what the, what the technology industry is doing to us as individuals and as communities. And I've, I've been uh, cognizant uh, for some time about this sort of um, ideology behind uh, behind the technology industry and, and and that animates Silicon Valley and so on and I actually remember for a long time finding it all a little confusing like the just the idea um, the idea of how what was going on in the Bay Area technologically was going to somehow sort of save the world I didn't quite get it and um, uh, when I discovered your work, it was really like an intellectual breakthrough for me because you, you've just done an extraordinary, um, an extraordinary job tracing the threads of ideology um, uh, back through the 20th century in a way that I think orients us uh, in, uh, to, the, to the present moment and, and to the relationship with technology and, and media that we you know, find ourselves in in the, in the early part of the 21st century. Gosh, thanks. Thank you. Um, so um, I want to start by um, uh, by drawing out a, a kind of an arc that you that you trace. So it, particularly in your last two books, you uh, you depict sort of a um, um, a historical process that kind of begins in the 30s. And goes through the um, through World War II, um, the fifties, the counterculture, and um, and leads us to the the sort of contemporary or like near contemporary cyberculture. Mm -hmm. And um, I wonder if you can um, help us uh, put that into context a little bit. Help you know help the, those who are not familiar with your work uh, see that arc, so that we can talk a little bit about uh, about the the early parts of that. Arc. Sure, absolutely. Um, I, I love the idea that we're going to start with with utopianism. I think that's the right place to start. And not only California utopianism, but a kind of deeper American um, hope, even a utopian hope for, for democracy that goes all the way back to the first digital computers, late 1940s, even a little bit farther into the research world of, of World War II. Um, and the discipline that was at the time called cybernetics. 
So the, 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 the key thing about the mid-century that, that still shapes our time, I think, is the effort to get away from top-down systems, mass systems, one-to-many systems. You know, when Americans confronted fascism during World War II, many thought the Nazis came to power because they had mastered mass media, one-to-many broadcasting, essentially. They thought Hitler had, had succeeded in reaching through the microphone, down through the radio, out through the movies, into your mind. And, and, and making you a kind of a fascist. And so the challenge for Americans in that period, especially American media makers, was to build a different kind of system, a more leveled, more egalitarian, more individual-centered system. Norbert Wiener, um, a research scientist at MIT, a mathematician, a child prodigy, worked with a group of sociologists, psychologists, technologists, and together in the late 1940s, they began to formulate um, a set of ideas that shaped computing and our world more generally, and those are the ideas of cybernetics. And just very briefly, the cybernetic model is one in which the world is an information system, you are an information producer and consumer like a computer, and you move through the world seeking feedback. The world gives you feedback, you change your behavior. And out of millions of individuals seeking feedback in that way, each along their own track, according to Norbert Wiener, order will emerge. And in Wiener's vision, that's precisely the opposite of the top-down systems of fascism or by the 1950s of communism. So I think that, um, I think that people listening today might mm -hmm. hear this idea that, uh, that fascism was brought about by radio as mm -hmm. like, it, it almost seems ridiculous, I think, but okay. I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, just if you haven't thought about it, but one thing that I'm struck by reading your work is how how extremely plausible this see whether it's true or not maybe it's true maybe it's not I'm actually curious your point of view but I, I'm struck by how um, how plausible that was to people in the 30s. Well, it was especially plausible to people in the 30s because radio was so new. You know, many many adults in the 30s had been born in a time like my grandmother turn of the century, where there was nothing in the house at all. There was, you know, might be a magazine or two, but there was no radio. Maybe you went to the movies once in a great while, no television. And, you know, in that space, radio really was, was something new. It was in your living room. It was um, something you heard and that felt intimate, but that wasn't. Um, the other thing that's important to remember about why they were afraid is, is this one-to-many feature. We're so used to social media where it's many-to-many -many all the time. You know, people really thought in the 30s that... Um, you know, radio was, was both a tool that a crazy leader like Hitler could use to broadcast his madness to the world and a model of the fascist system. Um, when you went to the movie theater, some critics thought, um, especially German critics, you, you sat in rows, you oriented your attention toward a single screen, and for those two hours, you became obedient. You turned yourself over to the will of a creator. And you know, again, we're so immersed in media now that we forget how terrifying and how powerful wall-sized moving images were at the time. You know, there's a famous discussion of, of French, a French audience um, seeing a train. They see a train on the screen, the train is coming toward them. People leap out of their seats and run screaming because they haven't yet learned how to watch a movie as a movie. And, and that's how powerful these things were. Uh, one example that might surprise you, certainly surprised me when I found it, um, in the Saturday Evening Post in the, in the late 30s, um, there were frequently four fascists discussed, Hitler, Tojo, Mussolini, and ready for it, Franklin Roosevelt. And they called him a fascist. They were afraid that he might be a fascist because he was so good with radio. They thought that he, like Hitler, was finding a way to get into our psyches and persuade us to build a centralized National Reconstruction Administration. Terrified. And, and so, so that's how extreme the fear really was. Yeah. And so there was a group of intellectuals in the, in the late 30s um, uh, in, in North America who believed that a different kind of media philosophy needed to be invented um, to, kind, to sort of inoculate uh, Americans against fascism, or can you say a little bit about that? Absolutely. So, so, so to begin with, what people were afraid of with media was that they would have a kind of psychological effect. And lots of folks believed that the core of a society was the, the character of the people in it, that your individual psychology was the root of democracy. And a group that took that idea most seriously and promoted it was a group called the Committee for National Morale. At the start of World War II, Americans faced a problem. 
how are they going to do propaganda on their own people without turning them into the kind of authoritarians they saw in Germany? I mean, if mass media produced an authoritarian society, how could we use media to, to make Americans get excited about the war and fight fascism without turning them into authoritarians? The Committee for National Morale was formed to try to answer that question. It was led by an art historian, but it featured altogether about 60 people, um, all of America's most elite social scientists, um, anthropologist Margaret Mead, her husband Gregory Bateson, um, folks from, from Harvard's psychology department. And they came up with and developed the notion of the democratic personality, a personality that would be flexible, open to others, not just tolerant, but embracing of difference. Um, by the early 50s, though it's been long forgotten, particularly embracing of racial difference and sexual preference difference. We often think we're the first time to, to launch large-scale anti-racist protest and large-scale campaigns for sexual preference diversity. We're not. Um, so, so this group got together and began to advise Roosevelt. They wrote books. They had public platforms. And they said, what we need to do is develop a mode of communication that is person to person and that, that facilitates the growth of a democratic personality in each individual. And from that growth will come an American style of unity, a style of unity different from the fascist German style. And that's what Norbert Wiener picks up when he goes to, to building and, and being around people who are building computers. It's that idea of an individual centered collaborative world. Granted that that world is organized by engineers and social scientists, set that aside for a moment, but it's that individual centered world that they're trying to build through communication and that I, that dream filters right into the early development of computing. And I'm, one thing that, that, um, that really interests me about, about this is, is the, um, the nature of the media experiences that these people created. So um, there were, I, I guess, I, I, I suppose you coined the word surround. I'm not sure that- yeah, Democratic that. surround. I, I coined the term. I had, to, I, I had to name the thing I was seeing. I kept seeing this yeah. form was everywhere, but there was no name for it. And, you know, when you're a scholar and you, you find these forms in, in, in the archives, you start to think you're crazy until they, they come so consistently that you're like, okay, fine, I'm going to name it and get it out of my hair. So the Democratic surround. These folks, the, the, the Committee for National Morale, you know, they're social scientists. They don't know how to make media. Um, but they're in New York in the late 30s. And by 1937, you have a series of Bauhaus artists who have migrated to the United States. And they know how to make surround media. They've been over in Germany building these multi-image surrounds, mostly for things like museum display. Now, you know, today we think museum display, it's, it's not a powerful political force. But, but certainly in the 30s, museums were thought to be places where you could go and see images and internalize experiences and make yourself a different kind of person. And so there's a guy named Herbert Beyer, um, who's a designer. He's responsible for that lowercase Bauhaus typeface we all use these days. Um, also responsible for um, helping get the Aspen uh, Institute up and running. It's another story. Anyways, he comes over and he brings something called the 360 degree field of vision design. And this is a, a sort of a, um, a way of showing photographs and pictures at all levels around you, over your head, at eye level, at your feet, in front of you, behind you. And this is very new in the time. You know, at that time, most images are shown, you know, right at eye level. Look at a picture, look at a picture, look at a picture. And he says, no, 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 no. What you need to do is enter this environment, enter this, I use the word surround, be surrounded by these images and choose the ones that are meaningful to you among those images. That way, you will have a shared experience, but it will still be your own. You'll be a free individual. So anyways, um, Bayer comes to New York, and he needs a job really badly. And, um, you know, he'd been kind of a, a socialist at the start in Germany. But here in the U.S., um, he teams up with Margaret Mead, Gregory Bateson, folks who are at the Museum of Modern Art, and begins to design propaganda exhibitions along these lines. And those propaganda exhibitions um, become the foundation of all kinds of things. They become the foundation of a 10-year propaganda campaign, but also of art world choices, um, ultimately, I would argue, of psychedelia, and going, going whole hog, um, I would argue it's it, a lot of the ideas that are formulated there form the foundation of the kind of social systems, particularly things like Facebook, that we're seeing online today. Yeah, and, and, and so, I mean, I guess it's, what, one of the things that strikes me about this is the, is the, uh, the thought that um, that being a democratic citizen is somehow like a sensory experience of some kind. 
it's like yeah. something that we, you know, by moving through literal, literally spaces or arrays of choices or, you know, where there are photographs around us and where we're deciding where to place our attention. Yep. Through that process, we are uh, giving meaning to something that might otherwise seem formless. And there's some connection between that and the and what the United States government, you know, thought that it meant to be a, a democratic citizen. Right. And, you know, and it's interesting, right? I mean, you know, the, the Committee for National Morale was not the only group active in this period. There were people who were saying to Roosevelt, look, you know, Goebbels is doing a great job with propaganda in Germany. We should do the same thing. We'll deprogram our people later. Um, but, but for the committee, yeah, they really believed that the core of every society was a kind of modal personality type. And that, and we needed to cultivate a modal democratic personality type. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, Gordon Allport's one of my favorite people. He was a psychologist at Harvard. And, and he said this in 1942, um, writing in a paper uh, about the democratic personality. He said, in a democracy, every personality can be a citadel of resistance to tyranny. In the coordination of the intelligences and wills of 100 million whole men and women lies the formula for an invincible American morale. Three key ideas there. Personality is the source of resistance to fascism and to tyranny. Um, coordination, rather than top-down domination or hierarchy, is the best way to manage that. And people have to be psychologically whole in order to resist. If they are fractured, fragmented, dominated, they can't resist. And those three ideas, I think, really are, are, are still valuable. Yeah, um, I think and one of the things that comes through very strongly to me in your work is this: is this the the tension and the complexity of people with with really interesting ideas about what it means to be a democratic citizen and the sort of ease of appropriating those ideas. So there's yeah. just we're sort of always walking this line between. Absolutely. And and you you picked up on this earlier. There's a way in which these folks want to engineer a free world, and you know to our ears that sounds Orwellian. But to their ears, it sounded like the best alternative to trying to dominate your way to a, to a, to a, to a world that you control. It seemed like the benevolent kind of control, right? Um, you know, Wiener called cybernetics um, the science of control through communication. You know, the, the communication can provide these visual systems, these sensual systems that make us whole people. And once we are whole people, we will naturally seek and produce freedom. Yeah. And um, so I'd like to connect this now to the um, to this, the the culture of the 1960s. So, right. there's uh, these these media experiences that are designed to sort of uh, facilitate a democratic way of thinking became in the 1950s avant-garde happenings, which became the 1960s be-in. Mm -hmm. Um, and something happened in that process where the the sort of the character, the pro democratic character, changed in some way. Can you say a little bit? Oh, a lot. Thank you for, for raising that. It's really it's a really important shift, and it's one that we haven't thought a lot about. So so in the forties, thirties, forties, especially the forties, after after Germany, you know, launches a fascist state built on racism. The, the, the folks who are involved in the Committee for National Morale imagine that this system that they're going to build, this visual system, will be radically anti-racist, radically um, pro-diversity of all kinds in American society. Um, Ruth Benedict, one of Margaret Mead's close friends, her former teacher, writes a book about, Ameri about race and science in America, arguing that we have a racist history like Germany does, and we need to confront it and address it. So, so, so the, the surround form in the 40s is seen as a really politically radical form. As we move forward, you know, it becomes a kind of um, display form that gets used by the United States Information Agency in Europe after the war to kind of try to democratize European citizens. It's sent to Russia famously in 1959 at the, at the um, American National Exhibition in Moscow, um, where a giant geodesic dome 200 feet across seven screens showing multiple images designed to help Russian citizens see and engage with the variety that is America to take it in and to feel themselves as democratic people. All of that's going on. But it starts to, to, to see the, the, the political critique of the 40s fade away. What begins to take its place is a kind of therapeutic consumerism. You know, as we start to, to try to sell America to Russia, 
we're selling the psychology of democracy, which has become the psychology of choice, no longer the psychology of tolerance, embracing difference, but the psychology of choice. Where do you choose? Well, you choose political leaders and you choose products. And so the sort of Herbert Beyer idea that I will choose images that are meaningful to me and knit together a whole person has started to become, I will go shopping and choose consumer goods that are helpful to me. And that will be the kind of freedom we have in America that we're trying to export. So that's going on there. The other place the surround really travels is through the art world, as you just pointed out, particularly through the work of the musician John Cage. He moves to New York in, in 57 and starts teaching um, sort of immersive musical styles and happenings. Um, how to stage events that people can be surrounded by, that are random, and they give audiences the experience of kind of you know, semiotic democracy. They can feel all these signs, knit them together, and make them make sense. Um, the trouble is that as Kate starts to do that, again, the politics fall away, and it starts to become a, a, an almost purely aestheticized project. And, there are strong ties between the art world and the propaganda world in this period. Cage himself was, was deployed for propaganda purposes in Europe. Um, what fades away are, are, are the politics, but what remains is the importance of using communication to produce whole people. And the self really becomes the center of the political action. Um, and that idea travels into the 60s in ways that I think are actually quite pernicious. Um, should, shall, I, shall I dwell in the 60s? Well, sure. Yeah. I mean, what, what strikes me is how right, right here we can, we sort of see the origins of the idea of like the rock concert as a political experience, right? Absolutely. Um, as a, yeah, but you're exactly right. So this is exactly how rock concerts come to be seen as political. You know, we're going to go and collectively experience an internal condition of individuation and collectivism at the same time, and we're going to experience it ecstatically. And, and this is something that really comes alive in the 60s, but has roots in the 40s. The, the 60s idea is that when we have a be in or a happening, or when we drop acid or you know, listen to, to Jimi Hendrix play, we're going to have a kind of ecstatic experience that will lift us up out of ourselves and help us feel connected to the whole universe. You know, one of my favorite examples, there's a very famous bee in the first bee in actually, it was 1966 in New York. And the poster for it said, at a big circle, said, we are all one, we are all one, we are all one, we are all one. That's, that's what psychedelic ecstasy produces, the feeling of being all one. But the language of being all one is actually the language of the universal humanism of the World War II era. We are all one is how we resist the Nazis who are busy saying that, no, 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 there's good guys and bad guys. There's, you know, Aryans and others. No, no, no. The idea that we are all one is, is rooted in that push against fascism. But by the 60s, it becomes a kind of ecstatic, consumer-driven experience. It's something you can buy a ticket for. Right. And, and, the, and the actual character of the experience somehow comes full circle and starts to resemble the mass experience of the rally or something right? right you know and i think you know you've you've talked a little bit about um walt disney and like walt walt disney's idea of the collective experience and um yeah what, one of the key features of the democratic surround in the 40s and 50s was that the images or the sounds always had space between them and so mm -hmm. you could look at something and then get a minute of a break and turn and look at something else Disney was very careful starting in the 50s to make sure that his experiences had no breaks. You know, his goal was to build, for example, he built a, a 360 degree movie display that was designed to make sure that you had no place to look that wasn't controlled by him. And, and that's a kind of mode of control we see emerging that I think sometimes people mistake for the democratic surround. I, I think it's a deeply um, authoritarian style. Um, yeah, so we There's we, just, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. There's like a there's a uh, line that um, uh, that that you've drawn out at least for me between experiences that um, that that sort of flood you sensorially and deactivate your reasoning ver yeah. uh, versus experiences that that enable engagement. Um, right, and th that's a really important distinction. The 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 great fear of of people who feared radio and fascism in the middle of the century was precisely that it would deactivate your reason. It would either get around or deactivate your reason. And that 
was perversely the, the, the great fears as among you know, more traditional Americans, more conservative Americans, as they started seeing rock concerts. It began to look like, oh my gosh, these kids, they're doing what we fought this whole war to prevent. They are becoming ecstatic crowds. Meantime, to the kids at Woodstock, the, the, the men who were leading the fight in Vietnam and, and you know, leading us into ridiculous wars, um, they looked like the fascists too. They looked like hierarchical, bureaucratic, you know, engines of, of trouble. Um, and, you know, one of the things that shocked me when I started researching the 60s was how there really were sort of two movements in the counterculture. I'd always been taught it was one movement. I'd always been taught that it was sort of, you know, anti-war during the day, psychedelics at night. And, you know, on the contrary, the new left, which really did politics to change politics, was quite distinct from the commune-based movements that fed into the tech world. You know, in the commune-based movements, um, you didn't want to protest. You know, you know, Ken Kesey actually went to a protest and said, ah, don't march. That's what they do. If you want to change the world, go home and live differently. And that idea of going home and living differently is rooted in the 40s also. I'll be a different person. But by the time it happens in the 60s, it's be a different person by consuming different things. Buckminster Fuller said, you know, take the products of mass industry and repurpose them for your own personal transformation. And once you are transformed, you know, the world will transform around you. You know, we still hear that, um, you know, in New Age speak a lot. Um, and you, you, my, my, my sense is that for a lot of reasons, it was the communalists who ended up coming out of the 60s with an awful lot of influence. And it was in funny places. It was in the tech world. Um, it was in the new age movement. And the new left faded away. But I think the new left had the stronger and more important critique. Yeah. And it, it, if you look at the new communalists, there was an, another thing that seemed to happen there is, is that they, in, in rebelling against institutional forms, they sort of, um, they sort of created these uh, notionally flat um, uh, hierarchy free spaces, but because they didn't have any structure, they, they turned out to be uh, playgrounds for bias and uh, misogyny and racism and I, 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 I mean, I was so shocked, right? So, so, you know, my first book was about Vietnam and I spent a lot of time talking with combat veterans. And I, I was so distressed by the end of that book that I wanted to write about something more cheerful. And so I, I thought communes, they were happy. Well, I started interviewing people who were on communes and on the contrary, it turns out that when you build a community around the hope of shared consciousness, um, what you do is you take away the rules and the, the boundaries that help you negotiate um, you know, the, the sharing of resources across inequality and you start instituting rule by cool. So you know, on, on these communes, you start seeing you know, charismatic men running things, women pushed to the side, um, a lot of sexual freedom, but often to the advantage of, of, of straight men. Um, you see racism, very, very quiet. It's no, nobody says, you know, oh, you know, we can't have black people here. What they say is, you know, they're just different. You know, they're just, just uncool. And people say that. And, it, and so we end up in this world where law disappears, and regulation disappears, and what takes its place are stereotypes, cultural norms, the very things you're trying to escape. And, and, and those are things that I think we see in our world now. They, they make me very nervous. Right. And I mean, the, that spirit, that, um, that new communalist spirit, that set the tone for the Silicon Valley culture, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, and I think that, you know, when you, when you look at the, uh, the sort of um, uh, ultra optimistic, sunny, view of what the internet was going to do to humanity it was informed by that thinking it was informed by that yeah right? yeah it's very specific you know so what happens in the early 80s is that the the folks who've been living on communes in the bay area need jobs the communes are pretty much dissolved the 60s are over and where many of them go is into the tech world um you know probably the most famous example of this a little earlier is steve jobs who spent a year on the all one farm um, you know, so, so, so common people filter in and when they get there, they bring with them this idea that Buckminster Fuller promoted, the peripatetic architect. He said, you know, you should become comprehensive designers. Take the products of industry and valve them. Make a new community of consciousness. So when they get into the tech world, it looks like, you know, and Stuart Brand will say this, you know, LSD maybe wasn't the right trick. You know, maybe that wasn't the right technology. But look at these computers. Look at the Mac. Now we can finally do it. 
And so, yes, networked computers are supposed to help us build distributed communities of consciousness of a kind that we tried and failed to build in the 60s through the communists. And they're supposed to be not tools of the Cold War military state, but tools that we can use to enhance our consciousness so as to build a different kind of democracy, a person-centered, collaborative, communicative democracy. I think a lot of us still hope for that on the internet, but as you can see, that's, that's not where we're at these days. It seems to me that a lot of the, um, um, a lot of the, some of the thinking that you, we still see around now um, in this area traces back to that idea from the, to the 30s of, of like creating the whole person. That, you know, so for example, if we can make information available to everybody, if we can just connect everybody, then everybody will be able to come, become a whole person. Um, and there's something uh, very individualistic about that that um, that strikes me as 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 worth pointing out um, and I'm curious whether whether you think that 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 preoccupation with the individual whole self mm -hmm. as opposed to the community which might require a little bit more thought about institutions yep. um, you know is is um, you know is that the problem is that still something that we need to um, to be careful about. Yeah, it's something we need to be very alert to. You know, on the one hand, it has, I think, been been very liberating in a lot of ways, you know, um, at different times in different ways. But but when we look at, you know, public quests for authentic selfhood in the 60s, and I'm thinking now of Stonewall, I'm thinking of the latter parts of civil rights, I'm thinking of feminism, you see people turning inward and saying, in order to be a whole person, I need to claim this public identity. I need to speak in this way in the public. And that opens up, I think, um, an ability to talk about, address, and celebrate modes of being people that were sort of tucked away and hidden in earlier eras, even by people like John Cage, um, who was essentially married to another man, um, and yet sort of never spoke about it. So, so that's quite valuable. The, the, the flip side, though, is, is, is that we live in a world where we are surrounded by companies whose business it is to sell us technologies that um, help us become the kind of people we want to become. The extent that we focus on that as a source of political change, it becomes very easy to simply engage in consumption to try to do that. I'm going to wear the right kind of t-shirt. I'm going to wear the right kind of combat boots. You know, I'm going to get my Doc Martens and I'm going to march. The other piece of that is that under you know, the conditions that we now inhabit of surveillance capitalism, where companies like Facebook want us to be constantly expressing on their systems so as to keep us there monitor, map our, our performance, and then sell us goods on, the, on that basis. You know, there's a tremendous kind of solicitation of individual expression. And if we are soliciting individual expression, we, we, we are given, we are being offered the chance to fulfill that countercultural mandate. Now I will be myself. I will be myself publicly. I'll be myself wholly. But it's a trick. Because as you do that, you are precisely becoming productive for an, an, an industry that, that wants you separated, individuated, and expressively productive. What they don't want, what that industry doesn't want, um, is precisely what you were pointing to. It's the ability to negotiate difference, to call out contractual malfeasance, to invoke laws that apply to everyone, not just to me personally. It's a society that is genuinely public, not personal. And, and I think that's a real challenge to the extent that we're bought into the desire to produce ourselves wholly and honestly and publicly we may also be turning away from the institution building that will actually, I think, you know, set the stage for that work to be possible and to, to carry through in time. Yeah. Um, I'm struck, uh, uh, I'm struck today uh, as we l take a deeper look at our institutions than we've maybe ever took, ever taken mm -hmm. that, um, that there, you know, there are there as as with almost everything in in your uh, in your work, you can see two sides. So, so <laughs> in in um, uh, because it does seem that we we're having to grapple today with the fact that systemically racist institutions, for example, other kinds of oppressive institutions, have formed us, mm -hmm. right? And, and it is through some kind of, of um, breaking the self away from, from institutions. Like there is some kind of, of uh, 
of inward turn that can help us get some of these bad influences out, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then there's then you just walk that fine line of you don't you don't want to um, you don't want to neglect the 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 need to to build valuable institutions going forward, right? Yeah. Is so I, I have a lot of thoughts about this, and this is something I wrestle with all the time. I don't I don't think I have a, a firm view on it. You know, I, I think about um, you know early feminism. You know, my mom was a, a a very early mother, dropped out of school to have me, went back to school. And you know, a little later in her life, um, was was active in feminist, just feminist consciousness raising groups on our little suburban street. And I think they were enormously important for her and for her friends, you know, because together in the kind of privacy of their own, you know, room, they were able outside outside the public sphere to just talk to each other about what it meant to be a housewife and how they might imagine their lives differently. So I, I think we've known for a long time that consciousness and culture and norms are part of public life and are part of political life. Um, I think we're often offered a false choice between consciousness and culture and institutions. And I think that's a legacy of the World War II era. I think that we were so terrified of bureaucracy, of the top-down worlds of fascism and communism, and the counterculture so aggressively adopted that language with which to critique our democratic institutions that we've been left with this kind of habit of dismissing and undercutting institutions that, are, are, that can be enormously powerful for our benefit. A couple examples. You know, civil rights, the, the early part of civil rights was about literally claiming rights in a civil, in a civic space. You know, Martin Luther King made, he didn't just call us to be different kinds of people. He called us to build different institutions that would allow different kinds of people to work together. You know, he, he, he had the poor people's campaign. You know, we are, we are to do structural things to make structural change. When early civil rights marches on Washington, people carried signs that said, I am a man. You know, now when a black man in the late 50s, early 60s carries a sign that says, I am a man, he is not necessarily claiming the uniqueness of blackness. Rather, he's claiming his common humanity with the people who are in charge. I think that's enormously powerful. And a rights-based legislative framework lets you make those claims and stake them. And those marches lead pretty directly to the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which is imperfect, which has not solved all our racial problems, but which sure made things better. Um, you know, we can see similar kinds of things, I think, um, more recently um, in, in the work of gay marriage. You know, to someone like me who grew up in a rural town where, um, you know, uh, my effeminate male friends were just bullied relentlessly, whether I have no idea what their sexual preference actually was, but they were, you know, thought to be gay. You know, to, just to grow up in that world and within a single lifetime to inhabit a world in which men are married to men and running for president and it's okay, mind-blowing. And part of that mind-blowingness comes not only from all the, the, the marches of ACT UP and, 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 and the, the sort of display of authentic personhood, but also from the ability to translate that expression into legislation that produces marriage, that produces rights. And I, I think that's the challenge that, that we face now. Um, and I, I think we can do it. I, I think we can do it. I, I, you know, we, we do live in a time in which our institutions are threatened by oligarchy. Um, but this morning, you know, I, I turned on the on the radio and the Supreme Court, conservative as it is, had voted five to four um, in support of DACA. So, yeah. so those, those institutions still really matter. And we, we need to be tending them. We need to be engaging them. So if you look at um, if you look at the legacy of uh, cybernetics, um, I think, you know, one to me, one way of understanding that legacy is that it um is that it kind of disabled the notion of the of the enlightenment subject right it said that we you know we 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 are we are just participants in feedback loops there are things that are outside of us that are creating our selves and then ourselves are are participating in, in other things mm -hmm. um and um you know some people think that 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 point of view, um, you, you know, undermined our ability to, um, uh, you know, to respect rights in the way that you're, that you're talking about and respect like the dignity of the human individual. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, what strikes, what strikes me though, and, and, and I have a lot of sympathy for that point of view, just to be clear. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what also strikes me is that I think that if you actually go back to an older tradition, 
the, um, that definitely that influenced cybernetics, which is to say the the uh, the, the American pragmatic philosophy yeah. tradition, right. right? You really see you almost see like a um, a, a proto cybernetics there, right? Where where you know John Dewey, for example, saw humans as um, uh, as kind of like bundles of, of habits and patterns that were, you know, formed by our social contexts. And um, uh, so it, it, in a way, it's, ki it's kind of guilty of the same anti-dignity, anti-individual sin that people accuse cybernetics of. But in Dewey, you still see this incredible respect for institutions yep. and a real attentiveness, like how to build the right kinds of institutions that allow people to participate in democracy, that allow people to um, uh, function in diverse societies and, and disagree with each other and these kinds of things. Um, and I wonder, I wonder if you have any thoughts on like what, what got lost there? Like how, how did we lose that? Um, uh, where did we lose track of the ability to understand ourselves as part of systems while also retaining respect for for dignity and, and oh, I love that! What a great question. Um, I could write a book trying to answer that question. Um, the I think that the, the key thing. So, so I think the cybernetic stealth has a benevolent and a malevolent side. The benevolent side is the side descended from Dewey, and it's the side that says we live only in relation to each other. I can't move forward in the world without seeking feedback from you. I can't know my direction until you until I bounce off of you, and you can't know yours until you bounce off of me. And, and that's, that's a, a very cheering view. The flip side, of course, the malevolent side is that the, the cybernetic self is somewhat hollowed out. It's sort of only behavior. And, and, and that's the side that we see computer science taking up today. We see um, behavioral scientists trying to sort of, you know, map and monetize our behavior so as to, to change it. And that's a deeply um, non-dignity oriented view of, of the self. Um, I think we lost, and this is the deepest irony and it pains me intensely, I think we lost um, the, the habit of thinking of the dignified self in the way that you describe it, the sort of human-centered self that, that all of us have for all, despite all of our differences in the 1980s. Um, and I think with the, the, the kind of critique of the liberal self of grand narratives that, that really um, you know, kind of lit up postmodern theory, postmodern culture, the left, um, that really turned us away. You know, we went through a generational critique, starts in the 60s, but really flowers in the early 80s, a generational critique of this idea of, of liberal America, in, in which we are all fundamentally alike despite all of our differences. And, and that idea has really gone away. We've, we, we've got so good at focusing on and performing our differences that I think we're struggling to um, work across those differences. Now, I will say that I think Black Lives Matter gives us an extraordinary opportunity. It's like, two giant doors have just been thrown open. And we have a chance, I think, to, to, to bring back together those two things that have been fractured before. You know, we bring back together the sense of being our authentic selves, but also that relational sense of being together, being our, our selves together. And finally, the thing that excites me the most is the opportunity to change the institutions we have and, and maybe even build some new ones. And I, I think that would be terrific. Great, I think that's... Uh... That's as good a place as any to uh, to end. Thank you, uh, thank you so much for this. Uh, wonderful to speak to you. Oh, Matt, thank you. I'm I'm really delighted to be here. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks for a great session, everyone. Uh, it's time now for our Q&A. Uh, so Matt and Fred, if you would, uh, please take it away. Hi. Hi, Fred, how are you? Good, good, good. Uh, do we have questions to answer from the, from the audience? We do, we have some great questions. Um, although uh, before I get to the, the, some of these excellent questions, I wanted to, uh, point out that I don't know if you got a chance to hear uh, Daniel Allen's uh, talk earlier in the day. No, gosh, I wish I had. 
she um, she said something that jumped out at me as like uh, like the answer to the question that we paused on uh, mm -hmm. basically, which was which was that um, I'm going to sort of um, I'm not going to do justice to the way she put it, but she said that the the way that when we look to define ourselves relationally mm -hmm. in this you know Dewey and kind of way, mm -hmm. the, the, she suggested sort of the criterion for whether that works is is whether it's empowering and um and went on to provide sort of a, a, a an analysis of of what exactly that means and it's just struck me as like the a criterion that uh could sort of guide the guide the inquiry that we were were um starting to make there i love that i wish i'd heard that i think empowering matters and i think also um making more equal matters a lot and that's a part of the empowerment piece i'd, I'd love i'll have to go back and check that out yeah, I love her work. Uh, so, um, as do I. Um, so, uh, let me start with a question from uh, Cortina, which is, uh, uh, how intentional was all of this? Uh, how much did the government encourage choice in shopping over political choice, um, or the replacement of the citizen with the consumer? So, was this uh, intentional? It was extremely intentional. So, so uh, in the early 50s, the United States government got very anxious because the Soviets were promoting something called the people's communism, and it seemed to be working. It seemed attractive, particularly to third world peoples that we were trying to woo for, for our side of the, of, the, of the fence. And so um, the government actually got a, a, a historian at Yale to convene a group of advertising executives and develop a campaign called the people's capitalism. And it, it built a huge display inside Madison Square Garden, a really fascinating kind of place that, uh, sorry, not Madison Square Garden, the train station. Um, in any case, uh, it became a, a really deliberate, deliberate effort. And I think that in the minds of executives and government folks across the 50s, America's economic engines were evidence for the rightness of our political views. And the, the, the choices that we made as consumers were evidence that we had the right to make choices politically. Um, so it was a very deliberate government policy. Um, how about this one? Uh, what role should the media be playing to reduce hyperpartisanship? Are there too many opinion journalists? This is really tough. You know, I, I think we've undergone since the 80s a transformation in our media landscape. We blame it on the internet, but it really isn't the internet. It's cable and a series of other things that have individuated and personalized our, our discourse. And we've just got to get past that. Um, I, I think the real problem actually lies in a couple of places. I think that in the social media space, we need regulation desperately. Um, the idea that Mark Zuckerberg and his uh, company should not be responsible for anything that appears on the site um, is, is just not helpful. They are a publisher, whether we call them that or not. Um, we may be their writers, we may be their contributors, but they are a publisher and we should hold them to that account. Um, the other thing that I think is, is really a, a challenge is the absolute lack of public broadcasting. We have um, a financial model that cuts across all of the media and privileges controversy. So when something sparks, when, when Trump tweets, it, it's beholden on not just social media, but mass media to cover that, make news of it, talk about it, chew on it. Um, you know, we have an enormous news hole that needs filling every day. Controversy fills that hole and draws us toward it. And until we change the economic model underlying that news hole, we're not gonna see a difference, I think, in, in the question of controversy. This is from uh, Fanny and Malik. Um, what is the role of education in the building of the democratic citizen? How do you become your whole self and develop a critical mind? Oh, what a great question. Um, my daughter is a teacher in Maine, and um, I think that's what she tries to do every day. It, the, I, I think it's exactly what education does and, and should do, and it starts early and has to go on for a long time. There's no, there's no quick fix. It's certainly not just pre-professional education. It's the things you learn in first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade about how to share, how to work with your neighbors, how to, to work with different neighbors. My third grade class, I grew up in a, a mostly white rural town and my third grade class, we sang folk songs. And you know, that was wonderful. To me, that opened up a whole world of, of kind of protest possibilities. When you sing Pete Seeger, when you sing you know, Bob Dylan, you practice being a citizen who can speak out and, and, and ask for peace. And teachers are the people who instill those possibilities in us when we're still young enough to absorb them and can learn them and, and act on them later in our lives. So this, this last one is a question that um, 
could take an hour, but uh, or more, but we've no. got to do it in one minute. Uh, which is, okay. uh, what are your hopes and fears about uh, ideological developments in the blockchain space? The blockchain space. Wow. Okay. So my hope is that um, we build alternative currencies that allow people to connect in some of the ways that we dreamed of in the early internet era. My fear is that blockchain goes the way of the dark net and becomes um, an almost kind of authoritarian structure, accessible to some, inavailable to others. Um, and, and that's my nightmare. Thanks so much, Fred. Um, it's, uh, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you, Matt. Really glad to be here. Thanks, everybody.